Hello, and welcome to today's Facebook Live event, Mindfulness Strategies for Managing Caregiver Stress. I'm Kurt Miller, Director of Public Relations for Brook Lane. We're glad you've joined us. This is the first program in a series of five sponsored by Brook Lane and Potomac Case Management Services in recognition of National Family Caregiver Month. Please visit brooklane.org for information on the other upcoming Facebook Live programs. If you have any questions during this program, please add them to the comments area so that I can relate them to our presenter. The program today is Mindfulness Strategies for Managing Caregiver Stress and is presented by Melissa Lynn Canis, a licensed certified professional counselor. Melissa has worked in the mental health field in Washington County since 2006. She is the director of Hope Counseling and Wellness Center, where where the focus is treating the whole person through a multidisciplinary approach of psychotherapy, massage therapy, yoga therapy, and holistic health coaching. Additionally, she provides clinical coordination for case managers and care coordinators at Potomac Case Management. She has a passion for working with young clinicians, beginning their careers, and provides supervision while also serving as an adjunct faculty member at Grand Canyon University. Welcome, Melissa, and thank you for being with us today. Good afternoon. It's a joy to be able to join um, in this format, in this forum. I am excited to be able to talk about this topic today and follow up for, with some further um, practical techniques from the discussion that was begun at the main event um, for this um, Brook Lane and Potomac Case Management sponsored um, focus during this month. So um, glad to be able to uh, continue the discussion today. Um, focusing, as you mentioned, on mindfulness strategies for caregivers. And I just wanna provide a little bit of education about our bodies and how they relate to stress so that we can understand why some of these techniques are beneficial and how they work. Um, our central nervous system, which um, basically our brain down to our heart, to all of our organs to keep our body moving, um, has both the sympathetic part and the parasympathetic part. And our sympathetic nervous system is that part of our body that has sympathy on us when we're under stress or need to engage that fight or flight. And what ends up happening is that when things get turned on in the, because our body's having sympathy on us, um, sometimes they can stay turned on. And that's where our stress just is, we're, we're constantly feeling the symptoms the um, elevated heart rate, the tense muscles, the racing thinking, um, shortness of breath sometimes. And so the benefit of mindfulness strategies is to turn on the other side of that nervous system, which is the parasympathetic. And so mindfulness really comes down to recognizing the power that we have to keep our body in a healthy, grounded, centered space so that all of those symptoms um, can be more manageable and, and within our control, our ability to control. Um, because as we talked about Saturday, the long-term effects of keeping uh, those symptoms ongoing are, have really negative effects on us. So that's the reason that mindfulness is so beneficial um, to, to our overall health, um, not just mental health, but also physical health. So the, the first thing that I want to kind of highlight is the importance of understanding how to do a body scan, how to stop in the present moment and pay attention to what's happening in my physical person. If, do I have a headache? Is there ringing in my ears? Are my shoulders tense? Is anything rumbling and grumbling inside of my belly? Do, do I feel tension in my legs? Am I tingling anywhere? Is my heart rate a little more elevated? Just being able to stop and just almost like a computer scan would come all the way down, pay attention to what's happening. That's the first step in just getting present. And from there, focusing on my breathing, recognizing how shallow it is, how deep it is, how rapid it is, how slow it is. Am I breathing through my nose? Am I breathing through my, my mouth? Where is my breathing? Um, how, how is my breathing happening? 
And then we start to really take control of our breathing. Um, and the purpose is because we want to make sure that that parasympathetic side of us is really starting to get engaged. So co constantly teach about the um, importance of diaphragm breathing, which is that belly balloon that we all have um, in our abdomen. A lot of people, you know, when you go to the doctor and the doctor says, take a deep breath, they really mean put a lot of air in your chest because they're listening to things in your chest and in your back. But a deep breath is not um, something that you hold in your chest. A deep breath is actually something that you hold in your stomach, in your abdomen. Um, and it's that diaphragm muscle that you want to have engaged when you're doing deep breathing. So I, I'm um, always encouraging people to make it as simple as possible, just like I would teach a child, I'm gonna teach an adult. You imagine that you're smelling flowers and you're blowing out candles so that you're breathing in, your inhale is always through your nose and your exhale is always through your mouth. As you're breathing in that air, you're putting it all the way down into that balloon so that your stomach is expanding as you are blowing that balloon up in your stomach. And then your stomach is um, contracting as, you're, as you are blowing the air out, blowing out the candles. That's the basic start of any mindfulness strategy to pay attention to my body, pay attention to my breathing, and then slow the systems down by doing some deep breathing exercises. The more rhythmic you can make it, the more in control your body begins to feel. For most people, a rhythm of four seconds. Breathe in for four, hold it for four, breathe out for four, rest for four, and then start the process over again. And then you do it for four rotations, four, 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 four times. Um, that's the basics. That's where you're gonna start. So any other technique that you do, that you try and implement, you always wanna start with just getting the body in control and bringing the breathing into um, the right alignment for yourself. Side note, this is a really good technique to use when you're laying in bed at night and your brain won't stop and let you go to sleep. Um, just controlling your body through doing those exercises is really helpful to get things to slow down um, to help you with sleep. So another thing, once you've got all of that under, under um, in a healthy balance, in a healthy order, um, you want to start um, paying attention to the rest of your environment. The 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 art of mindfulness is really about being connected in the space that I am because worry and stress puts me in a space other than where I'm at generally because I'm thinking about the what ifs or I'm thinking about the should haves or the could haves. Um, mindfulness brings me present with the things that are right within my control in this very moment which is where our senses come in and play a huge, huge role. Um, we have five senses. And um, so an, an activity that I like to promote is the five, four, three, two, one, where you start with your sense of sight and you pick five things that you can see and you describe the heck out of each of those things. So currently I am seeing my blue pen. It is blue. It says staples on it in all capital letters with white font. It's got a 1.0. It's got this cap that's removable. It has a slanted top with three little indents in it. I pick five things that I can visually engage and describe them to myself. It keeps me focused in the current space that I'm in. Then I pick another sense, um, maybe sense of touch, four things that I can touch. And I describe with descriptive words of my tactile sense what I'm touching. It's easier for me to stay focused on tactile if I close my eyes, because then I'm not tempted to start describing what I'm seeing. So I have this smooth object that is a little flexible 
and um, it's pointy. Actually, it's a little sharp on one end. It's very thin, feels like a wire. Um, I can manipulate it to make different shapes and movements. It's a um, paper clip, you can't see it. Um, so I would take four things and just be present with something that I can touch. Um, when we're with our caregiver, our care recipient, sometimes being able to touch our care recipient is helpful um, to just stop and put our hand in their on their head and feel what it is to touch their hair, whether it's dirty or clean or curly, or maybe they don't have any hair and we're just feeling the stubble of their um, bald head, whatever the case may be, being present with our care recipient with our senses as well. Now, sometimes those senses aren't super pleasant. Um, maybe we're focusing, we're gonna do three things that we can smell and they're not super great things that we can smell. Um, I There have been times where it's recommended when moving into working with your care recipient that you take a little bit of um, chapstick and put it underneath your nose or a little bit of smelly lotion and put it underneath your nose and focus on that sensory experience so that you are not focusing on some of the less desirable sensory experiences um, of what caregiving sometimes um, brings us. So five, four, three, two, one. Five things I can see in my environment, four things that I can touch in my environment to keep myself grounded and present with the person that I'm caring for. Um, three things I can smell, two things that I can hear. Um, maybe it's not the care recipient complaining. I'm not focusing on what they're complaining or saying to me um, as far as like them being frustrated. Maybe I'm hearing the tone or maybe I'm hearing um, their breathing, focusing on their breathing or focusing on my breathing, like hearing my breath that's coming in and out. Um, and then certainly one thing that I can taste, um, always, I always have mints or gum or candy um, accessible to just be able to take that and have that, that last sensory experience in a moment. That, that's a strategy for just staying mindful in the current space that you're in, um, whether you're by yourself or with your caregiver. I'm sorry, care recipient. Um, another thing that's really beneficial for the, the breathing and slowing the body down and also just puts you in more of a childlike state is blowing bubbles. Um, if you remember those little kid jars of bubbles where you pull the wand out and you, and you try and make as many bubbles as you can and then all the kids chase them around and try and pop the bubbles. Blowing bubbles is a really beneficial way of slowing your body down um, with the breathing, um, but also just getting into a childlike space and recognizing that just being here right now is the only thing that I have control over. And when you pull the wand out and you let those bubbles go, depending on where your headspace is, it's helpful to see that bubble as like, going into the universe and then the universe just grabs it and says, I got this. Um, if you're a person of faith, you offer it up as a prayer and just say, okay, I'm releasing that. If it's just something you wanna destroy, then you just let the bubble go and you, when it lands, just splat it. You take some ability to just kind of be a little childlike and present with yourself while also um, doing your breathing. Another thing that we talked about on Saturday was the benefit of journaling. Journaling is a wonderful mindfulness strategy, and not everybody gets into that. They don't like to write stuff, um, but if you're somebody that really can um, sit down and take five minutes to just journal your thoughts, it's a really beneficial mindfulness technique, and it's also a storytelling um, technique or storytelling activity that you can come back to at different points in the caregiving journey. Um, some suggestions about journaling is to make it a routine so that it's done in the same space at the same time um, on a daily basis or a consistent basis. So maybe you're somebody that likes to end your day 
um, sitting in your favorite couch with a glass of wine and you just write some, some notes in your journal. Or maybe you're somebody that prefers to start your morning sitting in the same space with your journal and a cup of coffee. Um, maybe you're somebody that just likes to do that on a Saturday morning when you have a, an extended amount of time or a Tuesday afternoon, whatever the case may be in your schedule. Something that's um, just an important thought to keep in mind about journaling is to keep it consistent. It becomes more meaningful when our brain recognizes that this is a controlled activity that is meant for um, my benefit. Um, that is meant for calming and uh, grounding for myself. So body scans, um, being when we're with our caregiver, paying attention to our, our care recipient. I'm sorry, I keep saying that. Our care recipient, doing our body scans and paying attention to what's happening inside of us and then treating it, paying attention to it. There's nothing wrong with saying, you know what, right now I'm feeling a little bit elevated, so I'm gonna step out for a minute. And I'm going to do whatever my strategy is. Maybe I'm going to blow my bubbles. Maybe I'm going to lay on the floor and do some deep breathing, do my five, four, three, two, one. And then I'm going to come back in because I've stopped to take time to pay attention to myself, to pay attention to my body. Recognizing that we do have this sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system and we can control our bodies if we're intentional about it. We can't always control our thinking. Sometimes thoughts just show up um, without us being aware of it until they're on the screen, so to speak. Um, we call those intruders. Those are intrusive thoughts that just pop in there. But we can, even though we can't control those coming in, we can stop and control the way that we navigate our bodies. Um, deep relaxation, progressive muscle relaxation is something that's helpful for a lot of people. Um, if you, if you do your body scan and you're recognizing that there's some tension in your, in your midsection, um, your abdominals, your, your hip area, you're just kind of sitting on it and holding it in there, trying not to explode. Being, being intentional about tightening that entire part of your body, all of those muscles, just contracting everything at the same time, as best as you can and holding it for as long as you can and then slowly releasing it, you will find that there is a physiological response that as you're constricting all of that blood flow and then you intentionally release it, it, slows, it slowly moves back into place with a more, um, I guess, rhythmic pace. Um, that's probably not the right way to describe that um, medically, but it, it does slow down the process um, of the blood flow and brings some release into that area of your body. If you have time to do progressive muscle relaxation from toe to head, wonderful, wonderful um, strategy. You just start with your toes and you curl them as tight as you can. Slowly release them. Move up to your calves, same thing, same technique, all the way up to your body, all the way up through your body. Um, and it's a, it's a intentional process of saying, I'm going to slow this train down. We are not going to keep being all worked up. I'm going to take control over, um, whatever's happening in my body in the moment. Um, so those are some body things. Being mindful with our care recipient, um, paying attention to, um, the physical interaction that we're having with that person. Very often we get caught up in the activity of the caregiving that we forget about the person of the care recipient. Um, so maybe you're doing a bathing activity and all you're focused on is um, the actual actions that you are, um, that you're performing. Making those moments more mindful it involves storytelling as you're going through the activity. It involves eye contact as you're going through the activity. Um, maybe it involves some descriptive words. So remember I was talking um, a few minutes ago about the five, four, three, two, one, and using your senses to describe what you're engaging. Maybe it's doing that while you're engaged in the activity with your care recipient. 
This is doing tasks mindfully. Um, if I'm making a cup of coffee for my care recipient, I'm talking about the aroma of the coffee as I'm bringing that into them. Or they're asking for cream, and so I'm talking about the color of the coffee as I'm making it. Um, back to the bathing thing, talking about this, the scent of the lotion or the soap or the texture of the washcloth that you're using and engaging, being mindful with your care recipient, it's gonna help them as well. Because what they don't realize is that you're actually engaging them in a mindfulness strategy as you're um, doing the task um, mindfully, mindfully with them. Um, the other thing is making eye contact. Contact is really important with our care recipients. Sometimes it's so easy to just move into the behavior and forget to make a personal touch. And in our culture, that's kind of become a lost art in many ways. You know, you can go into a convenience store and the person that's taking care of you never looks at you and you never look at them because you're so engaged. Yeah, that, that's fine. You know, with our phones and stuff, really, really bad habits that we've gotten into culturally. And then it, it moves into our other activities. Being really aware of that with um, our caregiving activities is very, very important that we're just stopping and we're connecting on a soul level with the other person as much as on the physical level with the person that we are, that we're taking care of. Something that I came across as well in thinking about um, our, our talk today is um, being mindful of our own needs. We talked about this at the event on Saturday. Um, one of the things that I wanted to um, mention that I took out of a book um, called The Conscious Caregiver. Um, I want to give credit to Linda Abbott, the author of this book. Um, she talks about specific exercises in her book. And one of the things that I really liked that I wanted to pass along is called making a happiness list. And she uses list as an acronym, L-I-S-T. L stands for your likes. What are the things that you like? I, what are your interests? And then ST are your satisfying things. What are some of those things that bring you fulfillment? Um, so you go back and think about what did you love doing as a child um, when you didn't have anything else to do and you were just hanging out? Were you a bike rider? Were you a checkers player? Were you a watch cartoons person? Um, make a list of some of those things and find time to engage in those activities. If there are activities that you can do with your care recipient, like watching cartoons or playing checkers, then create space to do some of the things off of your happiness list. What, hobby, what hobbies do you have now? Or things that you enjoy doing as an adult when you have free time? Like maybe you like to read, Maybe you like to watch old movies. Maybe you're into the Hallmark Channel. Um, finding time to do that just by yourself or creating space to do that with your care recipient. It becomes very meaningful if, if you can, and not every relationship, not every caregiver, caregiver, care recipient relationship is super pleasant. So you have to certainly evaluate that. But if it is a relationship that you're trying to make pleasant, finding some of those activities that are meaningful to you and bringing it into the caregiver space. So if you enjoy watching Christmas movies on your own, schedule the time to watch a Christmas movie with the person that you are a caregiver to and enjoy try to find time to enjoy your mindful activities with the person that you're caring for, as well as taking that time to find time to do those things on your own for yourself. Um, think about your go-to people. Mindful caregiving means having a list that is my speed dial list of who I call first when I want to share great or not so great personal news or personal events with. 
Maybe it's just a friend, not that they help you with any caregiving necessarily, but maybe it's just a friend that I have in a different state, or maybe it's a former coworker that really seemed to get me. Um, part of having a happy list, happiness list includes having those people that I share things with, good and bad. So when the caregiving goes wrong and the person that I'm providing care for is less than grateful um, or less than happy that I've showed up to do whatever task needs to be done in that moment, um, I can call and vent. Um, there's an app that I like to use, it's called Marco Polo. And um, the benefit of this app is that the person that you're speaking to doesn't need to be on the other side. They just want, you send them a video, it's like a video chat, um, but they don't have to be present. You just send them the vi video and whenever they're ready to watch the video, they get on and they watch the video and then they respond and it's video back and forth. And the benefit of having those things is you can just get on there and vent. Blah, 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 blah. And then sometimes five minutes later, you realize, man, that was a little much and you can just go delete it. Or sometimes your, your um, friend, confidant, whoever the person is, can actually get back on and then validate like, man, that sounds like it was pretty crazy. Having those connections is part of mindful caregiving because you're recognizing that this is a task that I am going to engage in that is less than desirable. And there's somebody out there that's going to validate the fact that, you know what, you're doing it, you're showing up. You're caring, even though it's undesirable, even though it's not always fun, even though there's not a, an applause. Um, they validate the fact that you're you're doing you're doing those tasks because our care recipients don't always do that. Um, our care recipients often give us less than desirable feedback. So being intentional about making a list of those go tos is really important. Also, think about what environments make you feel good. Um, and engage in those environments. You know, many people find a lot of benefit being next to water. So going and sitting at the river or at the lake or taking a trip to the beach, um, getting yourself just a little water fountain in your house that's trickling water down those, um, I forget what they're called, but they're beautiful aesthetic pieces that we put in our homes and in our offices having those kinds of things, even getting noise machines that um, create some kind of an ambient, ambient noise that feels soothing for us. Um, creating an environment that feels really good for you. Um, and then I mentioned earlier about the, the importance of our senses. Using your senses um, for your mindfulness benefits, like if you really like chocolate chip cookies and the smell of baking in your house, then bake some cookies or go buy a fragrance that you spray that smells like chocolate chip cookies. Um, keeping, keeping those senses engaged is really, really uh, beneficial in mindfulness. Um, I mentioned that app. There's actually a lot of apps that are out there that um, offer meditation. And I'll speak on meditation for a second. Meditation is a really beneficial mindfulness strategy. Not everybody um, has the courage to engage it because it sounds like um, you want me to just stop and say things over and over again, or you want me to stop and just listen to things over and over again. And some people, oftentimes we're a little critical of it until we actually give it a try. There's some really good apps um, that give it a try. And if you don't like it, delete it. Uh, there's one called Calm that people seem to really um, engage with well and enjoy, um, especially at nighttime. Good meditations um, to listen to or just some ambient noise that is relaxing and calming. Another one's called Headspace. Um, I have a lot of people that really um, give positive feedback on the Headspace app. There's another one called Unplug that is useful um, for folks. And then one called Simple Habit that actually walks you through some mindfulness strategies that, that you create as um, daily habits that um, I would recommend. Um, I wanna take a pause for a second and just ask if there's any 
questions or any comments, Kurt, that you want me to be aware of? I don't want to just keep chatting away. We have not had any questions so far, but if we okay. get something, I'll certainly let you know. Okay. Um, okay, so another thought that I would have about mindfulness is recognizing that um, we have a wise mind. Um, dialectical behavior therapy is a specific strategy in cognitive behavior therapy that people use. And it talks about um, creating your, your wise mind in your abdomen. Um, that's not specifically what I'm talking about, although that is a very effective um, strategy and a very effective tool. Uh, what I want to touch on for a second is the importance of recognizing that we have an emotional space that we move into, and then we have a logical space that we move into. And wise space is generally the overlap of the two. It's generally when we're working with, this is across the board, not just for caregiving, but to keep it specifically focused on caregiving. When we're working with our care recipient, only being logical all of the time is probably not fully beneficial. However, being fully emotional all of the time is certainly not going to be beneficial either. Um, oftentimes, our care recipient is in that emotional space all of the time. Wisdom, wise mind, is the overlap of saying this is what needs to be done. This is how we're going to be. This is how we're going to do it. These are the steps of accomplishing our goal, but recognizing that there's some feeling that comes with it as well. Um, oftentimes we're, we are tempted to be on one side or the other. And when we're on the emotional side, then we usually end up saying things, doing things that we have to circle back around and, you know, either apologize for or change the strategy for the next time. And on the, on the opposite side of that, if we're only focused on the logical mind, sometimes we miss our own emotional space and the emotional space of our care recipient. So I just want to mention the importance of focusing on the wise mind, the overlap of my emotional self, the emotional self of my care recipient, and just the logic of what needs to be accomplished and making sure that I'm keeping a balance um, of those two as I am going about the activities that I need to go through with my, with my care recipient. Something that came up um, at the Saturday event um, through uh, some of the ending conversations was um, the I need versus they need um, dilemma. Mindful caregiving is really a, often boils down to making a solid assessment of those things. Um, and I believe one person talked about the necessities versus the niceties, which I thought was a great way to say that. Um, someone else said the needs versus the wants. Um, we just need to focus on mindfulness is being attentive to the needs, both for my care recipient and for myself as a caregiver, and then evaluating what, where, when, and how I can accomplish all those things. And honestly, writing out a list is very beneficial for some people. I need this, they need this, and who can accomplish X, Y, Z? Because sometimes I might need to, um, I might need to accomplish a task at, at my job, for example, while my care recipient needs to be present for a CAT scan. And I cannot do both things. Mindfulness is saying, okay, this is a real need for myself. This is a real need for my care recipient. How do I accomplish both by bringing in an outside source? Um, where, can I, where can I make um, sacrifices and where can I not? And Am I making a sacrifice because it's absolutely necessary? Um, sometimes we, somebody mentioned guilt on Saturday and being mindful of our emotions. We, we already talked about that guilt is um, one that surfaces pretty regularly for caregivers. 
um, am I making a decision because I feel guilty and I'm using that language of, well, I should be there or I should, I should do this. Or am I making that decision because when I evaluate that they need and I need, it really is the best decision to make in that particular scenario. Part of mindful caregiving is making a solid assessment of my needs and my care recipient needs and evaluating what the um, balance is for both of us. Because oftentimes we lose ourselves in caregiving because we're not being mindful about those things. Um, we're not being mindful of navigating the needs in our own lives as much as we are navigating the needs in our care recipient's life. Um, so part of a, a healthy mindfulness strategy would be creating that list, their needs versus my needs. I need this. Um, they need this. How do I accomplish all of that together? Um, I mentioned a minute ago about should, I mean, guilt, um, the perfectionistic term that is always a ding, ding, ding word is that should could, I should have, I could have, I, if, if I only would have types of things um, that we're using in our, our thinking. Mindfulness is being aware of that. Um, as much as we start, mindfulness really starts in the body. Once we keep ourselves grounded and centered, it's also being aware of where we're getting off target with some of the emotions that are driving us to make our decisions. And our emotions um, are, are generally triggered from some kind of a belief system or some kind of a thinking pattern. So mindful thinking would be paying attention to where I'm getting too perfectionist in my thinking and, and getting caught up in should haves, would haves, could haves. Um, that leads to a road of exhaustion, always, always leads to a road of exhaustion. Another thought on mindfulness would be allowing ourselves to be distracted for a moment or maybe two moments or 10 moments. Um, so often we, we talked a little bit on Saturday about resiliency response or our resilience response. Early on in the caregiving journey, it's very easy to be fully focused on the tasks at hand with our care recipient um, because we're working so hard to generate an outcome that we're hopeful for. Um, allowing ourselves to stop that focus and get distracted by other things, which that happiness list that I was mentioning, um, allowing ourselves to get distracted by those things is super important. And I think that oftentimes we are, we feel guilty if we allow ourselves to get distracted. Um, rec mindfulness would be recognizing that distraction is not equivalent to avoidance. They are not the same thing. Distracting means I'm recognizing that it's there, but I am shifting my focus to something else for a period of time with full intention to reconnect with um, whatever the event is, whatever the, the, um, the need might be. Mindful caregiving is allowing myself to have intentional distractions throughout the caregiving journey um, so that I can lower my distress um, because distress is going to be a part of the journey. Um, mindful caregiving recognizes that there's going to be distress and figuring out strategies for tolerating the level of distress that comes, um, that comes with caregiving. I mentioned meditation. Meditation is a wonderful way to mindfully distract from whatever uh, distressing space we might be in. Um, now, I'm not suggesting that if your care recipient is falling out of bed, that you say, now, wait a minute, I'm feeling a little distressed right now and I need to go meditate and then come back. It's not, I'm not suggesting that we don't take care of the activities we need to take care of. 
I am suggesting that when our emotions are um, at a distress level that, um, or at a level that are causing distress, that we find mindfulness strategies to keep, to, to engage that parasympathetic, um, to keep us in a healthy, grounded, centered space. Meditation is a wonderful, wonderful strategy. Maybe you don't like to find a quiet place and sit down and focus on a thought, but you could find a quiet place to sit down and listen to music that speaks to your soul. Find a place to do that and really engage in all of the experience of that music, the tones, the volume, the crescendos, the, the changes in... Um, changes in the time, the changes in the rhythm, pay attention to all of that and really engage that. That's a way of meditating. Venting is a way of meditating. Um, I mentioned about that app where you just, when you need to, um, that's a wonderful strategy. Um, using your time effectively is obviously a pretty important um, master to do when you're a caregiver uh, and, and balancing meditation, music, Exercise. Exercise is a phenomenal mindful activity. And like it or not, paying money creates a level of accountability that um, we put to something. So getting somebody that's going to provide some kind of uh, physical training for us or joining a class or going to something at the senior center where they're having a dance night or something, Getting physical activity is a, a very, very beneficial mindfulness um, strategy. Um, sleep is actually, we talked about sleep um, at several points throughout the event on Saturday. Um, sleep is an important part of being a mindful caregiver, recognizing and valuing how much our sleep matters. Um, Pampering ourselves every once in a while. You know, if you're a lady and you like to go get your hair done a special way, or maybe you're a man and you love to go get your hair done a special way too, whatever. Um, nails, massages, if that's something that the budget allows, um, the, what's it called? The um, salt baths the salt caves, getting into those um, salt baths where you float, they're called floats, that's what they're called. Oh my goodness, the benefit of those things, now there's a financial investment to some of these activities, I recognize that. So um, for some, they're more accessible than others. But a float is a really great way to pull negative toxins out of your system. Um, and especially if you do the um, sensory deprivation floats, a uh, really tremendous way to elongate your spine and slow down everything inside your body, get your mind to really just shut down for a moment. That's a wonderful mindfulness um, activity. You know what else is a really great mindfulness activity? Laughter. Listening to comedians, listening to funny podcasts, um, there's so many YouTube channels, um, Netflix things that you can get on and listen to comedians that just make you stop and belly laugh for a minute. It's so healthy um, for our bodies to have good laughter. Actually, um, there's an Irish proverb that says a good laugh and long sleep are the two best cures for anything under the sun. Um, that Those are... Uh, Laughter is a really great um, strategy to employ as a mindfulness um, technique. Um, affirmations. A lot of people find great benefit from listening to and repeating positive affirmations as part of a mindfulness strategy for themselves. Um, and there's, again, there's all kinds of apps out there. You can find everything on, um, on the internet. Um, but getting a list of affirmations or talking with your therapist about um, some affirmations to employ where either you're listening to them or you're reciting them yourself and saying them out loud or you're writing them in your journal two, three, ten times a day. Um, 
very beneficial mindfulness strategy. Um, pay attention to what is a hindrance to you when it comes to your mindfulness. Uh, lots of people say, well, I just can't slow my mind down. I just can't stop my mind. Well, then focus on your body then. Don't even start with trying to do meditations or mantras or affirmations. Just do the body stuff that I mentioned at the beginning and try and get the body more grounded. Um, something that's really good for that is yoga. Yoga, whether you do that with an instructor in person or whether you're following a video online, um, it is going to really get you to focus on your breathing and then your muscle relaxation as you're doing different movements and different stretches. Um, highly recommend yoga. Um, let's see. I'm going through some of my notes here to see what else I can add um, for mindfulness strategies. Listening. Sometimes we... We, we have lost, I think, in many ways, the art of actively listening to others. Uh, being my, a mindfulness strategy is hearing what our care recipient is saying and repeating it back to them. Or hearing what we're saying emotionally, internally, and repeating it back to ourselves. Is this really what I'm feeling? Is this really what I'm thinking? And if we're with our care recipient, having that dialogue back and forth to say, well, yeah, dad, I hear what you're saying. It sounds like you're feeling blah, blah, blah. Or it sounds like that didn't that conversation with your doctor didn't go so well. Active listening with our care recipient is a really beneficial mindfulness strategy, both for them and for ourselves. Um, because again, it distracts us from the activity that we're doing in caregiving to being present with the individual for whom we're providing care. And I think that that's something that um, the longer we do it, the harder it gets um, because, because the heaviness of the ongoing activities um, becomes so consuming that we lose sight of being present with the, the soul of the person we're with. And we're only focused on the body and the needs um, that their body is telling us we need to um, take care of. Mindfulness is stopping the soul focus on the activity and the physical person that we're engaged with and trying to connect with the soul person that we're engaged with. And honestly, a lot of mindfulness is that, just being present with the soul of anything, any human being, um, firstly with ourselves, and then secondly with um, the person that we're with, um, whether it be our care recipient, whether it be a business meeting, whether it be somebody we're having coffee with, whatever the case may be, being present in that in that time and space. So mindfulness requires a lot of observation, a lot of self-observation, a lot of observation about our environment, and a lot of observation about our care recipient and um, who they are, where they are in that present moment as an individual. Um, we only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to check back in with you, Kurt. Anything that, any questions or comments? We don't have any questions at this point. If you're watching the presentation and you do have questions or would like some more information about something specifically that Melissa's mentioned, please type it into the comment section and uh, I'll be happy to relay that to her so that we can uh, supply information that you may be looking for. Thank you. Um, I'm going to put one more um, strategy um, out there, and this comes from EMDR, the EMDR technique, um, called a container. 
And it's part of, there's a lot of visualization um, that you can use for mindfulness strategies. Um, you might be familiar with creating a safe space where you visualize yourself in a particular environment that is comfortable and safe and calming for you. And then you go through your senses of being in that environment. So I am sitting um, next to the lake and I'm seeing fish jump out of the lake and I'm hearing children playing in the background and I'm feeling a breeze come across my face. Like I'm engaging my senses as I am visualizing myself being in that space. It's a really beneficial technique. And most people I've heard about guided imagery um, as a mindfulness strategy. The container technique is kind of similar to that only it's more prescribed in the sense that um, you are guided to create a container of any kind. Um, it can be big, small, round, um, short, tall, cylindrical. It can be a briefcase to a spaceship. It can be any kind of container. It's something that's gonna hold things. And your container is um, a space where you're going to put any negative energy, thoughts, fears, struggles, challenges. And the thing that's unique about the container is that it doesn't have any access port because it's you being able to just osmosis. You, you are able to put your negative stuff in there because it's only your container. No one else has access to it. Um, and as you're going through it, you describe what it sounds like if you touch it, you describe what color it is, the texture that it is. And it's a space that when I'm overwhelmed with the activity that I'm engaged in, I stop, I collect all of the negative thoughts, feelings, um, emotions, energy, and I put it in the container. The thing that's unique about the container is that it is under lock and key and only you know where the lock is and only you know where the key is. And you create a spout of some sort that you put on your container. And the spout or the spigot would be a place that when you feel ready and in control and safe enough, you go back to your container and you just open the spigot enough so that the negative stuff that was inside there can just be released it can, you can give your negative energy color, texture. Um, it can be a gas, it can be a, it can be whatever you want it to be um, because it's your container to put any kind of negative um, stuff in. So you're being mindful that it's there. You're being mindful to create a space to place it. And then you're being mindful to release it in a way that you're in control of when, where, and how you choose to do so. Um, so, that's another um, technique that's kind of a guided imagery technique that you can use um, to keep yourself present and not bring negative stuff into your caregiving role for that particular moment. Um, I think that is kind of covering most of the thoughts and notes that um, I had gathered together for today, Kurt. Um, anything that you think maybe I've missed or should revisit before we finish? I think you've done a great job covering the whole area of mindfulness and gave a lot of strategies and tips for people in terms of caregiving as well as for doing things for the recipients of care. So we greatly appreciate it. And thank you so much, Melissa. Absolutely. Hope you have a great day. You too. Take care.